Ulysses, as I say, cited in the Bond film there, if I put it on YouTube, it gets flagged and all that sort of stuff. That's why I'm not going to record it there. Is still there in British consciousness as a means of enduring the and living out uh, a noble, gentlemanly, knightly posture in a world that in which the strength of the British Empire is flagging, if not failing. So there's a sense of the weight of empire being too great to bear and yet they need to endure it. And so there's a, in this period, we also know a, a philosophy of stoicism, the stiff upper lip of not complaining. That was, it was actually Elizabeth's, Queen Elizabeth II's uh, motto, never complain, never explain. An allegiance to duty and doing it for the sake of the right thing and doing it without complaining and accepting that you will be criticized for it and still doing it. The poem that we're going to look at first is Ulysses. Ulysses is the Roman name for Odysseus, the first figure that we looked at on the course last semester. The wise, conniving, uh, in some ways rather distasteful figure in the sense that he lies and cheats and steals and deceives in order to get his ways, but also commits, has to endure a, an odyssey, a, a horrific trial of many years to get home. And so he's a model of resilience. He's an admirable man. And he does it and suffers the blow and, and in the end has to come home incognito and not be recognized for who he is and still endure and not reveal his identity. But do it because it's the right thing. It's the wise thing to do. And that becomes the model for Tennyson's Ulysses, which is directed not at a Greek populace, but a, at a British populace. How do you do your duty in our day? How do you act? And he, he writes on Ulysses here, not at the beginning of his life when he created the Trojan horse, but at the end of his life, when, where the Odyssey leaves off, when he's passed on his authority to Telemachus. And he leaves for one last journey where he's going to plant his oar in an upright fashion, sticking in the sand, signifying that he will sail no more. So that's Ulysses. Let me, let me read it to you. And then you'll see how it applies to the context of the British Empire uh, and uh, Tennyson's heroic ideal here. Ulysses. It little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. Remember, he's been away for 20 years. And in the, in the, and in the interim, his people have gone to seed. They've grown savage. And he's old. It's not for him. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lease. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that love me and alone. On shore and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea. I am become a name, for always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known. Cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all and drunk delight of battle with my peers, far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use as though to breathe were life. Life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence. Something more, a bringer of new things, and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, and this gray spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, 
to whom I leave the scepter and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfill this labor by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people, and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duties, descent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail, there gloom the dark broad seas. My mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Old age hath, yet hath his honor and his toil. Death closes all. But something ere at the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks, the long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to work, to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles, whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And again, I played the Bond thing. You, you see him running. He represents something there. And again, the, the very clever use of filmmaking there to uh, put Tennyson in the backdrop as the expression of the modern British spirit, which seems to be flagging in its virtue, in, its, uh, in the extension of its uh, empire, obviously. But remember, this is in the, at the height of the Victorian age when this is written. This is written in 1842, I believe. Or at least this is the edition of it, yeah. So at this point, British is, Br the British Empire is expanded and there's a sense of uh, hope and optimism, but that's not the note of Tennyson's poem. Tennyson's poem is suggesting a man who's, whose best days are behind him and whose virtue, is, insofar as virtue is connected with strength, is on the wane. And he cannot do what he once did, but he's not going to rest on his laurels. He's going to go out one last time and strive and not yield. So there's a sense of, of resilience expressed there and will and, uh, and duty and heroism that we'll also see is picked up when we come to his uh, Arthuriana poems, The Lady of Shalott. Any comments on it though? I think it's magnificently written. I mean, it's terrific. The cadences, the uh, use of literary uh, language, I could spend the whole class talking about how he uses uh, rhetoric in the poem. But uh, it all expresses a sense of indomitable will, yes. Yes. But it sounds profoundly British. Profoundly British, yes. To a point where at the end it feels almost Anglo Saxon in just the feel of the, um, the seafarer who can't, who must go out to see the world. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, the context of the Happy Isles, Great Achilles, the, what comes beyond death, we don't know. No hint of Christianity there. Do you have anything to say about the English spirit enduring throughout through all English literature and ending up all the way from Anglo Saxon literature to Tennyson? I wouldn't say it is a common theme. Saying, I wouldn't say that Tennyson is, has read the seafarer and copying that. N nobody knows of it. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. 
because it's a, it's a very common theme in, in, in British poetry from the seafarer onwards, which is a magnificent medieval poem, yes, which I didn't do on the course. I always feel badly about that. Um, but I do think there's a sense of British identity very much in, in not just staying at home but traveling abroad, which is even expressed in Tolkien's works. There's a hobbit side that wants to stay at home, and then there's the, the, the admirable side that goes on grand adventures. And the, the, the two exist in tension there, and there's something suspicious about both of them. To both of them, on both sides. And, and remember, the backdrop here is not just the British Empire, but there are people who are British who are born overseas and live their lives overseas, and they come back, and they're, 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 they're expats. They, they don't live outside the patria, outside the, the fatherland. They're born overseas, and yet their identity is wholly British. And they govern in that way, and they live lives of duty that are, in some ways, very challenging. And again, written for that age, but not an expre no expression of Christian faith in it. And so it, it, it's almost hearkening to a pre-Christian Britain with a sense, nonetheless, of that being inherently, intensely British to act in this fashion, yeah. And, and it reflects Tennyson's own doubts about the Christian faith. He was very much uh, aware of the importance of the Christian faith, while, uh, and the narrative that comes with it, while at the same time having, struggling to believe for a variety of reasons um, that it was true. And that would reflect, I would say, the establishment, more broadly speaking, in Britain in the 19th century, a fading uh, of the light of the gospel in the lives and hearts of many in Britain. And that will just uh, continue in the 20th century. Um, but as to comment on whether it's consistent, a consistent theme throughout British literature, uh, it's one theme that's there, for sure. But here he seems to be really hearkening strongly back to a pre-Reformation period, pre-Christianization even, not even mentioning of, uh, you know, Christianity at all. No Arthur here. Now, he'll do otherwise when we come to the Lady of Shalott. Any, anyone else have any comments or questions? I wanted to do, present it just as a terrific poem, but a, again, a sense of the, uh, the mindset of the era. And the fact that he uses Ulysses at the wane of his life, at the wane of his powers at the end of his life, to represent the British at the height of theirs is very interesting. He has a sense that Christianity is losing its significance, and because of that, the soul of the nation is also declining. At the very point where its political, military, economic power has come to its height, its soul has been lost. And it just is gonna hold on for a bit longer. So there's a, a, a deep pessimism there. Who likes the poem? Like the poem? I love the poem. 